Hey guys, welcome to my Moriarty Investing. In today's video, we're going to be talking about books. Now, I know a lot of investors that don't necessarily like to spend a lot of time reading, or sometimes people think that there isn't a lot of information to be found about investing in books, or even if they have read a lot of investing books, they get frustrated by the lack of specific instruction on types of things to do uh, with your investing, and instead of more of a focus on concepts and theories when it comes to actual literature on investing and finance. Now, I'm totally here and sympathetic with those beliefs, and I actually totally agree with a lot of those viewpoints in general, but that doesn't actually take away from my view that reading is one of the most useful things you can do when learning to invest, both because I think theory and concepts actually provide a more sound basis for your investing than just specific tips and rules of thumbs to work behind, but also because the type of mind that you develop with a lot of reading also puts you in a better position to think critically and to act with patience uh, and due diligence when it comes to making your own investing decisions. So because of that, I decided I wanted to start this semi-regular series where we'll be going over books that I have read in my investing journey that I think can be helpful for other people who want to read in order to learn to invest. Uh, this video today, we'll be starting with some relatively easier beginner books uh, that I think are good for anybody who hasn't read anything on investing yet. But before we get started today, I would really, really appreciate it if you guys could like the video and subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and perhaps tune in to one of our live valuation sessions where we value companies live, uh, taking in audience suggestions all the while. So these first three books that we're going to discuss are exactly as the title says, books primarily I've chosen for beginners, each of them for different reasons, which we'll get into. But if you don't haven't read anything on investing, these are the books that I would recommend that you start with. The first book we're going to talk about is The Little Book That Still Beats the Market by Joel Greenblatt. I've got it right here. Little book indeed, uh, small and blue, relatively cheap. Uh, it's a really, really good book. Uh, and I actually think it's one of the best ones, especially for beginners, partially because as Joel talks about at the start of the book, he wrote it basically to be understood for a child. Uh, but it also includes some pretty practical advice, despite the fact that I was saying that there isn't a lot of specific advice given on actual instructions of what to do found in a lot of these books. Though a lot of that advice does come towards the tail end of the book and he front loads it with a lot of really basic investing concepts, which we've kind of covered some of the things here. Uh, things saying that buying stocks means owning a business is earnings. So rather than focusing on stock, we're focusing on earnings. He talks about risk and he also talks about riskless uh, returns that you can get from interest rates, thus giving you a brief introduction to the idea of discount rates and uh, risk-free rates without even bringing up the specific terms. He talks about buying quality businesses at a discount and focusing specifically on the quality factor of a business. He gives a basic overview of, uh, of accounting concepts from like a, a gum selling uh, perspective or a lemonade stand type of perspective, a very basic business level understanding. Uh, he describes uh, the earnings yield, which is the inverse to a PE ratio, and explains how that can be used to identify value. He describes quality in terms of uh, return on capital, which is generally considered one of the, the more popular or qualitative numbers to be used. And the combination of those two, he describes what he refers to as his magic formula, which is a, relatively, a relative ranking system uh, for picking and choosing stocks based off of their earnings yield and their high returns on invested capital. Though his actual magic formula website, which he operates and is useful for people, can be found at themagicformulainvesting.com. I uh, highly recommend that. Uh, it actually is, takes a few more factors into account, but that uh, by website basically just ranks stocks based off of their earnings yield and high returns on invested capital and argues that, that the best system is to buy these stocks for the long run. Uh, he also provides a decent amount of proof showing how it works and why it always works over the long run and why it is that it will continue to always work primarily because people are not willing to stick with the strategy. He also does give a pretty strong statement that individuals should not pick stocks. And then as I said at the start, he immediately follows it up with some pretty specific advice on what to do if you're determined to do two big stocks at the end of the book. The next book we're going to talk about is One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Uh, another really, really good book. A lot less specific instructions in this book. Uh, instead, a, lot, a little bit more conceptual and a little bit more about the, the concepts of thinking about investing and how and why and where to find investments to think of. He starts by talking about why it is that the individual has specific advantages relative to institutions, hence the title. 
Uh, he talks about how every person is a consumer and all consumers have their preferences and all consumers also have occupations, jobs, uh, husbands or wives, friends, uh, and all these other places where they can get inside info based off of the places that people work. He talks about categorizing investments by type in order to understand the type of investment opportunities they have. He stresses to avoid hot stocks and how it is that uh, good companies are often in the most boring industries that are not being paid attention to people for one reason or another. He stresses not uh, diversifying when, into what he calls diversifying. Uh, he also talks about how it is that you don't necessarily want to jump on opportunities immediately. Uh, also, and this applies especially to IPOs and things like that, and how second opportunities in stocks often appear more often than they think long when you think that a stock is not going to go, come back down to a price that long since passed. It very well might when something bad happens. Uh, he stresses how a good balance sheet can uh, take a lot of the risk out of investment, how it's basically impossible for uh, the usual company to go bankrupt if they don't have any debt. And he also stresses how low institutional ownership and low analyst coverage can be a good thing because it means that there can be lots of value that's not being picked up by the market. I also talks about how insider buying can be a great signal. As the adage goes, people sell for a variety of reasons, but people only buy for one. And the third of our beginner books we're going to discuss is The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Now, I will say this is probably the most recommended investing book in the world, partially due to its popularity from Warren Buffett, who was a student of Benjamin Graham's, uh, and it's often referred to as an old classic. Uh, either in a good way or a bad way. So when I say that people are not willing to read books in order to learn investing, they're doubly less interested in reading especially old books uh, that they think are out of touch and no longer relevant. I would argue that while there is some content in the book that is not as relevant, it is uh, still filled with lots of timeless pieces of wisdom, as well as uh, a decent amount of information on long since forgotten financial history uh, that I think is important in a lot of a lot of ways. Uh, he stresses this concept of Mr. Market, the idea that the that the market providing strange prices up and down on a daily basis is the same as somebody coming to buy your, your property from you or your farm or your home or something. Somebody knocking on your door and offering you some random price each day. Just because somebody's offering you price doesn't mean you have to take it. He uh, stresses the differences between passive and defensive and slash defensive investors versus enterprising or aggressive investors. Uh, he gives advice for both of these categories, though I primarily focus on the section talking about enterprising or aggressive investors, which are essentially people who believe that they can uh, select the best value in the market rather than just invest passively and defensively. Uh, he does talk about 50 years worth of inflation data that had begun uh, that had been accumulated after. Uh, the release of the 1971 version of the book, which is the version that I recommend, by the way, the, the 1971 version of the book with modern commentary by Jason Zawig, uh, which, by the way, does alleviate some of the concerns of it being uh, too outdated of information when you can have a chapter of commentary following each of the original chapters relating it to more modern information. Uh, Jason Zawig is a columnist for The Wall Street Journal and a, a decent, really well-known uh, investor himself. And beyond the inflation data, he also talks about 100 years worth of stock swings uh, and declines going back even into the 1800s, which you may not think is relevant, but uh, time is a wheel and history does rhyme. Uh, he also refers to all different categories of investments, much similar to P Peter Lynch, the relatively unpopular bargain issues or net net operations, as well as arbitrages and hedgings, liquidations and special workouts. He was willing to operate in a lot of interesting uh a lot of interesting industries with a lot of special types of securities that other people were less fond of. Uh, he had a, a, a tendency to be skeptical of recent earnings. He is known for being especially focused on, on the balance sheet and the, uh, the book value of a company uh, and less focused on the earnings, though that the idea that he doesn't care about future earnings at all is a little bit of a misnomer, I would say, though he has a tendency to be, as it says, completely uh, uninterested in the most recent quarter or even the most recent year and instead looking at long-term averages of earnings. Uh, he believes in handling the future with the concept of a margin of safety, which is a term that he ha has used and many other investors have uh, rung its praises since then, which is the idea that if you aren't certain that your value is going to be accurate, you can never be certain that your value is going to be accurate. And so you must uh, buy it at a much lower price in order to ensure that many inaccuracies are being averaged out by this margin. Uh, he also was a big prolific user of screens in order to search for stocks. A lot of modern rule-based screen methods are based off of a lot of 
original uh, Benjamin Graham based screens. So with that today, we covered three books that I think are pretty good for beginners to get started in their learning to invest journeys. If you've enjoyed the content today, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel. We'll be doing some more videos like this in an ongoing series, as well as you should join us for some of our live streams where we value companies live, picking audience suggestions all the while.